Hey everyone, Maya here. Today we're going to be looking at the human skull from an archaeologist's point of view. I'm going to show you the basic anatomy of the human skull and the key features that archaeologists look at when we're trying to estimate the age and sex of any individuals that we found while we're on an excavation. We're also going to look at photos of three examples from real archaeological sites to see what else we can learn from them. Can we pick up on signs of injury, disease, or even cause of death? And what about things like diet and other things to do with culture that might help us really understand the life of the person that we've discovered? I'm going to get things started by using a plastic anatomical skull, but don't worry if you don't have one because the really handy thing about being a human remains specialist is that you always have your own reference collection to hand wherever you go. So, are you ready? Let's get started. The skull is the most complex part of the human skeleton. It houses sight, taste, hearing, smell, talking, chewing, and it protects the brain. So no wonder it's so complex. That's what makes it so awesome for trying to understand the evolutionary history of hominids. It's also one of the keys to understanding and estimating the age and sex of any individuals that we find while we're on an archeological excavation. There are obviously lots of ethical issues surrounding the recovery and analysis of human remains, which you can explore in the links. But the most important thing to remember is to always act with respect for the person they belong to in the past and for the people they may still belong to in the present. When you're handling a skull, there are a few important things to remember. The example I've got here is made of plastic, but real archaeological skulls can be very delicate. You should always handle them using both hands, preferably above a padded surface. It's really rare that you would actually handle both parts, the cranium and the, and the mandible together, and you should never be tempted to grip the skull through the eye sockets or the cheekbones. All right, we're ready to pick up our skull and do some anatomy. So the skull is made up of the cranium and the mandible, and the adult human skull actually has 22 bones. There are eight cranial bones and 14 facial bones. There are also six teeny tiny little ear bones, but we're gonna leave those aside for now and focus on the cranial and facial bones. We're gonna cover the bones individually very, very quickly in 90 seconds. Let's go. First of all, we've got the forehead, which is the frontal bone. Then on either side, we've got the parietal bones, Below that, we've got the temporal bones, which house the delicate organs of hearing. At the back of the head, we've got the occipital bone. If we open up the cranium, we can see inside that we've got the ethmoid bone, which houses the nerves for olfaction or smelling. And we've also got the sphenoid bone, which sits just behind it and actually forms the back of the eyeballs. Now we're on to the 14 facial bones. First of all, we've got the mandible. The maxillae form the dominant part of the lower face and the upper part of the roof of the mouth. They also hold the teeth. The palatines form the rear of the hard palate. The zygomatics are your cheekbones. The nasal bones form your nose. The vomer divides the nasal aperture and connects with the ethmoid bone in the olfactory centre. The two nasal conchi help moisturise the air as you draw your breath in and it goes on its way to the lungs. And last but not least, there are the two lacrimal bones. They're teeny tiny, about the size of a fingernail each, and they sit within the corner of your eye. And that's all of them. That's all 22 bones of the adult human skull in 90 seconds. We're now ready to go over things in a little bit more detail. So we're gonna go back over the cranial and facial bones and look at the key landmarks and features that archeologists will use when they're analyzing the human skull. So now we're going to look at the eight cranial bones and I'm going to highlight some of the features that archeologists look at when trying to estimate the age or sex of an individual. 
Don't worry too much about the detail now, we're just going to go through what the features are and we'll come back to exactly what archaeologists look at, what they can tell us a little bit later on. I'm going to start by showing you the top of the cranium. And these squiggly lines here are the sutures where the bones of the cranium join together. The sagittal suture runs from front to back and the coronal suture runs across the top of the head like a crown. The first cranial bone that we're going to look at is the forehead or the frontal bone and it runs from the coronal suture all the way down to the top of the eye sockets and the bridge of the nose. The flat central area is the frontal squamer and on either side you've got the frontal bosses. Archaeologists often look at how sloping or vertical the frontal squamer is and I'm going to turn the cranium to the side so you can see what I mean. This one is pretty vertical. The top of the eye sockets is called the supraorbital margin and the supraorbital notch, which you can probably feel on your own skull as an indentation, transmits the supraorbital nerves and vessels. The brow ridge here is the supraciliary arch for its fancy name and the metopic suture between the eyes can be useful for ageing, so worth making a note of. We'll come back to that later. If we return to the top of the cranium, you can see a pair of parietal bones on either side of the sagittal suture. We've got the left parietal and the right parietal. Each one comes all the way down the side of your head to the temporal bone. The temporal bone houses the delicate organs of hearing. This is the external auditory meatus, otherwise known as your ear hole, where you put your headphones in. And just behind it, again, you should be able to feel this, have a feel on your own skull. That's the mastoid process, and that can also be useful for estimating the sex. As is the length of this zygomatic process here. If it passes past the edge of the ear hole, that's worth noting too. If we return to the top of the skull, it's time to have a look at one of the most important bones, the occipital bone. This forms the back of the head. This is the nuchal crest where a number of nuchal muscles attach and they're involved in rotating and turning and moving the head. The foramen magnum passes through here and the occipital condyles that I'm holding right now articulate with the top of the spine. If we take a look inside the cranium, we can see on the inside of the parietals that there are these meningeal grooves. This is where arteries pass, which supply the dura mater, which envelops the brain. You can see that the meningeal grooves run from front to back, and it can be really handy to know this if you're trying to figure out if which parietal you've got. If you've only got one or the, the skull has come apart or you've only got pieces of it, it's a really handy thing to remember that the meningeal grooves run from front to back. Now if we look down here, this is the ethmoid bone. This holds lots of nerves to do with smelling and olfaction, a really important little bone. Behind it we've got the sphenoid bone it's shaped a bit like the butterfly and probably the most complex structure of all the bones in the cranium. It actually forms the back of the eye sockets. And the eye sockets are actually formed from seven different bones. So that's it. That is the eight cranial bones and some of the key features that are worth noting. We'll come back to them in a little bit more detail later. Whoa, well, that was quite a lot to take in. I suggest we take in a deep breath, in through the nose, out through the mouth. This is all going to become very relevant as we start looking at the 14 facial bones. Right, so the first thing that we want to look at is the mandible or the jaw. I'm actually going to start just by removing the cranium so that we can focus on the jaw. Obviously very good for chewing. One of the things we want to look at is the chin, otherwise known as the mental protuberance. It's often a bit more pointy in women. The gonial angle here is often again wider in females and more like closer to 90 degrees in males. The size of the ramus can also be indicative of sex. 
So that's the mandible, chin, gonial angle, ramus. And back to the cranium. The maxillae form the dominant part of the face. They also form the roof of the mouth and they hold the teeth. The two palatine bones form the rear of the hard palate and also the floor of the nasal cavity. The zygomatics are the cheekbones. So when you're praising someone's cheekbones, you're really praising their zygomatics. And again, the process, the zygomatic process on the temporal bone can be an indicator of sex if it passes the ear hole. The nasal bones form the top of the nasal cavity and join with the ethmoid bone, which is where a lot of the olfactory nerves, the smelling nerves, are housed. The vomer divides the nasal cavity and the two scroll-shaped nasal conchi help to moisten inhaled air on its way into the lungs. You should just about be able to make them out as I rotate the skull so you can see inside the nasal cavity. Last but not least, we've got the two lacrimals in the corner of the eye. Each one is about the size of a fingernail and are very, very delicate. Again, the eye socket, as we mentioned before, is actually formed of seven different bones. Quite impressive really. You'll never look at your eyes in the same way again. And that's it. That is the 14 facial bones. That wasn't so bad now, was it? So now that we know our way around the skull, we know the inside and outside of our own heads, it's actually time to start looking at how archaeologists look at all of these features that we've been pointing out to understand, to estimate an individual's age and sex. So how do we use these features to estimate the age of an individual? Well, the sutures are pretty key. This is where the bones join together and fuse as you get older. When you're a baby, all the bones of your skull are separate, but by the time you're in your old age, most of your bones have fused together. Each of the different sutures fuses at a different stage of life, and by looking at all of them, you can try and build up a picture of how old an individual was. So, for example, the metopic suture between the eyes rarely survives into adulthood. If that's still present, you can say that you've probably got a juvenile or a younger adult. The suture between the frontal bone and the sphenoid tends to fuse between the ages of 18 and 25. So if that's no longer present, you can say that the individual may be over the age of 25. There are also four maxillary sutures in the roof of the mouth, and these tend to have all fused by around the age of 50. So that's another good way of estimating what stage of life the individual you're looking at was in when they died. There are a few other indicators that you can look at on the human skull to give you an idea of an individual's age. The level of dental wear is often correlated with an individual's age, but you also have to be aware that the kind of diet that someone may have been eating may also affect that. You can also look for signs such as dental resorption, so when someone's teeth start to fall out, the bone around them that was holding them in place starts to resorb and disappear. These are all pretty context specific and you need to have a really good understanding of your population before you can use signs like these to estimate the age of an individual. So that's how you can estimate the age of an individual by looking at the skull. But how can you tell whether they're male or female? Well, just like with ageing, it's not actually that straightforward and you can't tell just by looking at a single part of, a, of the body, let alone a single feature. Instead, archaeologists have to build up an overall picture by looking at lots of different features across the whole body, especially the pelvis. But where that's not available, archaeologists can look at the skull. It's probably the second most useful part of the body for trying to estimate the sex of an individual. We've already looked at a whole suite of features that archaeologists can look at. So now we're going to summarise what they can tell you about whether someone was male or female. So typically, um, archaeologists would identify a skeleton as female if it has some or all or is more strongly leads, leans in this way um, with the following characteristics. So a female may tend to have a more vertical forehead, a sharper supraorbital margin, smoother brow ridges, chin that often has a point in the midline, wider gonial angle or jaw, and a much smoother nuchal crest. 
individuals that archaeologists will identify as male often tend to have a more sloping forehead, more prominent brow ridges, um, and the end of a zygomatic process that often extends beyond the ear hole. They may have a squarer jaw or gonial angle, a bigger ramus, and a more prominent nuchal crest and muscle ridges on the occipital bone. But that only represents the extreme ends of the population and the majority will be somewhere in between and have a variety of these different features. So, for example, if you have a feel of your nuchal crest, mine actually feels quite prominent, so an archaeologist who only looked at this feature might assume that I'm a bloke, but hopefully an archaeologist who might look at several different features might assume the opposite. Blimey, I don't know about you, but I feel like all of this newfound skull knowledge is about to make my head explode. Which I reckon means it's time to give all of you guys watching at home a chance to do something a little bit different. A chance to try and identify some of the features that I've been showing you by feeling them on your own skull. It's the perfect excuse to give yourself a little head massage, and I promise you, very relaxing. So, let's give it a go. Can you find your nuchal crest? Yeah, that's right, just reach around to the back of your occipital bone, the back of your head, and can you feel that little nodule just there? That's right, that's your nuchal crest. For some people it will be more prominent, and for others it will be fairly smooth and barely perceptible to the touch. Mine's quite knobbly, I'll have to say. Right, next one. Can you find your mastoid process? Yep, that's right, it's right behind your ear, behind your external auditory meatus. It's that knobbly lump right there, give it a little rub. You should be able to feel its rough size and shape. Again, it's one of those things that might be bigger in some people and smaller in others. And how about your gonial angle? Do you reckon you can find that? That's right, your gonial angle is just here. It's your jawbone. In women it tends to be wider, and in men it tends to be a bit more square, so closer to 90 degrees. You can feel it there. You can feel that mine feels substantially more than 90 degrees. And what about your mental protuberance? Can you find that? Give it a little rub. That's right, your mental protuberance is basically your chin. In women, it tends to be a little bit more pointy. Men can be squarer, maybe even have an indentation in the middle. So there we go, we have the nuchal crest, mastoid process, gonial angle and the mental protuberance. I've got a couple of other little questions for you because I think this bit's quite fun um, I don't want to give up on it just yet. What about this bone? Which bone is this? That's right, it's the sphenoid bone, it's that butterfly shaped bone, very distinctive, forms the back of your eye sockets and where it meets the frontal bone it can help with ageing, that suture tends to fuse uh, in adulthood between the ages of 18 and 25. And what about this bone? This is a parietal bone, no points for that, but can you tell me whether it is a left one or a right one? That's right, it's a left one and you can tell because the meningeal grooves are branching from front to back, which means that must be the front and that must be the back, therefore it's the left one. We're now going to look at real archaeological examples to see what else we can learn and how much we can put our newfound knowledge into practice. So this is the skull of an individual found buried at Solor in Norway. 
This person was found buried with all the typical accoutrements of a Viking warrior, including arrows, a sword, a spear and an axe. And you can quite clearly see that the individual has suffered a serious head injury. So, do you think this individual is more likely to be a male or a female? If you look carefully, you can see that the gonial angle of the jaw is pretty wide. The supraorbital margin looks pretty sharp and the frontal bone is almost vertical. Now these are just a few of the signs that archaeologists have looked at, but the researchers looking at this individual have in fact identified them as female. And not just that, but as the first female Viking warrior to have been found with a battle injury. Now this just shows how important it is to not go making assumptions. There's another really famous example, um, which is the Burka BJ581 burial. This grave was excavated in 1878, so an altogether different time from where we are now. It had long been held up as the archetypal high status warrior burial of the late Viking Age. It was interpreted as the burial of a high status warrior and was consequently assumed to be male. The emphasis was on the warrior and the sex was an assumption based on that interpretation. It was only when, in more recent years, osteologists were re-examining the remains for health issues in the earliest Scandinavian villages that they started to suspect that the sex had been misidentified. A new study was launched including DNA and strontium isotope analysis and recently confirmed that the individual was actually a female. This next example is from ancient Greece. We're going to have a look to see if we can spot any signs of illness, injury, cause of death, or medical treatment. Maybe, even if we're lucky, all four. Archaeologists excavating at Paleokratos on the island of Thassos found ten skeletons, including men and women. They all showed signs of living very physical lives and training for military combat. So the island of Thassos was in a really strategic location and had quite a strong military culture. Anyway, one of the skeletons that was uncovered was that of a male warrior. When archaeologists looked at his temporal bone, they noticed quite a few anomalies. First and most noticeable was this hole drilled into the mastoid process, that knobbly bit behind your ear. The hole had clearly been drilled with great precision and looked like trepanation, so an intentional surgical procedure designed to alleviate pain and stress. So the research team did some x-rays, which you can see here, to see if they could find out anything else about what had happened. When archaeologists looked at the rest of the skull, it was clear that he had received a blow to the head and that this had triggered a severe infection in the middle ear. It got so bad with all the pus and the goo and the build-up of pressure that it led some of the surrounding bone in the middle ear and on the temporal bone to deteriorate. When you bring all of these pieces of evidence together, it looks like what happened is the soldier received a blow to the head, it triggered a severe infection, and a surgeon was brought in to try and save him. He drilled a hole through the mastoid process to try and alleviate some of the pressure from the pus and goo that was building up and had some fair success. The individual survived for a period of time after the surgical operation. It's evidence of an incredibly skillful piece of surgery and a sign that this individual soldier must have been really important to warrant such incredible treatment. Unfortunately, it didn't all work out for the best, and the soldier, despite the surgeon's best efforts, died shortly afterwards. However, it is an indication of the kinds of detail that a bit of archaeological sleuthing around the human skull can reveal. We're now going to look at photos of some skulls from Mox Ixay Dulo Cemetery in Western Hungary. They all date to about 430 to 470 AD when the cemetery was in use and this was a period when the Roman Empire was collapsing. It was a time of huge social upheaval with loads of people on the move, some seeking sanctuary in fortified cities, others setting up their own new villages and settlements in rural areas. Anyway, this settlement of Mox Ixay Dulo was one such settlement in a rural area and when you look at the skulls from this cemetery it should be immediately clear that they're quite an unusual shape. 
Now these skulls have been artificially modified through a practice known as skull binding. This is basically where you take cloth and wrap it tightly around the skull of a child while the bones are still growing and it changes the shape of the cranium and you end up with quite an elongated skull. It's a practice that has been found in areas all over the world in all periods of time, so from 12th, 13th and 14th century Peru to industrial France. At Mox Ixe Dulo, archaeologists uncovered the remains of 96 individuals. Of these, 51 had artificially shaped skulls. Now, that in itself is quite interesting. It's the highest density of skull shaping in the region. But the archaeologists investigating the site wanted to understand a little bit more. Since it was a period of such cultural upheaval and since this was such a hot spot for skull shaping, they wanted to understand where these people had come from and when. Now, the research team used isotope analysis to try and establish where these people had come from, and the results of their research turned up something really quite amazing. Isotope analysis is a really cool technique that archaeologists can use to understand where people lived and what they ate and drank. So basically each geographical region has its own isotopic fingerprint that gets passed on to the food and the water that we consume. So since your teeth form during childhood, the isotopic fingerprint that they carry can tell you where someone grew up. And since your bones continue remodelling and forming throughout your life, an isotopic fingerprint from a bone sample can tell you where somebody was living when they died. You can then compare a sample from the teeth and a sample from the bone to see whether someone grew up in one place and lived and died in another. When archaeologists applied isotopic analysis to the population at Mox Ixe Dulo Cemetery, what they discovered was really quite amazing. They found that there was not just one group of people, some with skull shaping and some without. What they found was that there were actually three distinct populations and that they told a really amazing story. So the first group was found to be a local group. They hadn't travelled very far, but they are the ones that set up this new village. They'd spent their life eating and drinking local food and water, and they were buried in a local Roman style. But none of them had evidence of skull shaping, not one. The second group that the archaeologists identified was a group that seemed to have arrived from a different area about 10 years later. Some of them had artificially shaped skulls, and it seems that what happened is the local villagers welcomed this immigrant group into their population while the Roman Empire continued to collapse around them. Instead of fighting, what happened was they seemed to have come together, because the third group appears to be the descendants of both previous groups. Although many of them are buried in the local style, the majority have adopted the practice of skull shaping. It's a really uplifting story and shows that even in times of strife and turmoil, communities can come together and realise that they'll be more resilient, merge their cultures into something new and exciting. So that's about all we've got time for today, but I hope you've enjoyed starting to see the human skull from an archaeologist's point of view. I also hope you feel like you know the inside of your own head a little bit better and where the key landmarks are that archaeologists might look at were they to find your skull in a couple of hundred years time. If you're interested in learning more, I've dropped some links in the comments, so carry on reading, follow up, use your time to learn more about the skull. But we'll be back same time, same place next week with another archaeological adventure that you can enjoy at home. See you then.